Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We bless your name. Because of all that we are learning. We thank you because of the revelation you are giving us. We thank you for the ministers you have used since we began this Congress. In the main messages here, in the morning, midday, in the evening, every time you have shown your love to us in that you have filled your people to give us real messages from heaven above. Father, as you have shown your love to us like this, we are praying, O oh Lord, that we will receive everything you are sending to us through your people in Jesus' name. In the workshops, you have been teaching and instructing us, and we cannot claim that we have not known the truth. You are giving us the truth. Our prayer is that you will grant us the grace to be obedient as you teach and instruct us in Jesus' name. We come once again to the Beatitudes of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you will open our understanding so that we will see what Christ, our own Lord and Savior, what he wants us to see. And grant us the grace and the power so that we will live according to this truth in Jesus' name. We thank you for your blessing already. And we believe that you are going to continue to bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. This morning, we come to Matthew chapter 5 again. And as we have done every morning, we'll read from verse 1 again to verse 12. So that you will get the context of what the Lord is teaching us in these sessions. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. Already we have had two sessions. And we have dealt with some of the Beatitudes. We have seen what Jesus intended and what he taught when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. That these are the people that recognize that in themselves they are nothing. They have nothing. And they can do nothing to atone for their sins. These are the people too that have gone beyond the recognition of their worthlessness and nothingness. And they have been sorrowful over it. They have grieved over 
the spiritual destitution and they have mourned which means they have had godly sorrow for their sin and Jesus said blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted these people that have recognized their sins they have confessed and they are forsaken God has accepted them into his family and theirs is the kingdom of heaven they are partakers of that kingdom of grace whereby there is joy there is peace and there is righteousness not only that their mourning has made them to be comforted by the promise of scripture by the voice of the good shepherd they have been comforted by the comfort of the holy ghost and they have also been comforted by the fellowship of the brethren these are the people that are meek they are lowly they have got something of the nature of christ being meek does not mean that they are spiritually indolent or that they are lazy or that they lack zeal or that they are lukewarm being meek simply means in the oppression and the injury and the affliction and the insults and the abuses of the world they don't fight back they do not try to revenge and they do not defend themselves they may defend the glory of god they may contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints because their life is not to exalt and glorify the lord but as for themselves they will never defend themselves they act like jesus christ who was brought before his sharers but he was dumb and even when he was afflicted and oppressed he threatened not he opened not his mouth the cup that his father had given him he will drink patiently without murmuring and without complaining and these haven't shared the nature of christ they drink whatever cup the father permits to come in their lives and blessed are these because they shall inherit the earth in the present life god will feed them in the time of famine he will supply their need all these basic necessary things shall be added unto them god will supply all their need according to his riches in glory by christ jesus in the present life they will see no lack because the goodness of god will be available to them but then in the millennial reign when christ shall reign a thousand years these shall inherit the earth because they will reign with christ but these people are not satisfied only to recognize their poverty of spirit these people are not satisfied to have mourned over the sin they discovered within themselves even though they have not been comforted they are not still they are still not satisfied they are not satisfied simply to be meek they now have a passion a desire an hunger a thirst at a righteousness the kind of righteousness that goes beyond self-righteousness they must have anticipated the words of jesus christ except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven in anticipation of the death of righteousness and the height of righteousness required by the lord these people already they have begun to seek and they have begun to hunger and thirst they see righteousness as a basic necessity in the kingdom life as an ordinary man will see food and water as basic necessity in the physical natural kingdom and so these have begun to seek and in seeking for this righteousness they seek in the right source they do not seek it in religion because they know it's not there they do not seek it in philosophy they know it is not there they do not seek it in morality because they know it's not there 
They do not seek it in the attainment of the things of the world. They know it is not there. They come to the presence of Christ because they know it is him that the Father has appointed to make us righteous. But then you realize that these people who have been concentrating on what God has done for them. In verse 3, they have been poor in spirit. They having nothing. But now, in verse 7, as they have received mercy from the Lord, grace from the Lord, they are now going beyond receiving, knowing their poverty, they are now reaching out to be merciful. In verse 4, these were the people that were mourning, and they have shed the tears because of the nature of sin, because of the depravity, and because of the sin they see all around, the response to that, even though they have been comforted in verse 4, there's still a response. That crying and weeping and mourning has made God to look at them to make them to be pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. When those tears have gone through their eyes, it's like the tears, the mourning, the sorrow, cleansing their spiritual sight and cleansing their heart with the blood of Jesus so that now they can see the Lord. In verse 5, these are the meek, the people that will not be aggressive, that will not fight, the people that will not defend themselves. You insult them, you abuse them, you oppress them, you injure them. They are not going to fight back. They say, it is the Lord that has allowed Shimei to be cursing me like that. And if Absalom has risen against me, what have I to do? Maybe God will see the cause of Shimei and he will turn this in over. And if Joab will say, what is this deadly dog that he should call all these curses upon my Lord? Let us go over to the other side and smite him. No, this person is going to say, I may defend Israel and the glory of God against the Philistines. But when it comes to myself, I will never defend myself. Let him continue to curse me. But then, even though this person is meek, he doesn't stop there. The response to that is in verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. He is meek, never defending himself. But he doesn't even stop there. The meekness will lead him to become a peacemaker. And then we are being told in verse 6. Blessed are they. We do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then it says, they shall be filled. And you realize that this is the experience that the prophets of old had. In a measure. In a measure they are the righteousness of God. But then because all the world around them were unrighteous, you find that the world around them persecuted them. And Jesus Christ, the climax of the greatest example of righteousness, he came into this unrighteous world. And what did he receive from the hands of the people that were unrighteous? They persecuted him. And Jesus Christ, in conclusion of the Beatitudes, he said, Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? After righteousness, well, you are going to be filled with righteousness, but the result of that is verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You have that righteousness, you are going to be persecuted for that same righteousness. Now you can see as you look at the eight Beatitudes, four on the one side, four on the other side, and you match them together. Number one with number five. Number two with number six. Number three with number seven. Number four with number eight. You will see how one responds and answers to the other. We're looking at three today in particular. We're looking at being merciful, being pure, and being a peacemaker. As I emphasized yesterday, every point in this message of Jesus must have been very shocking to the religious people of his day. The Romans and the Jews, as I told you, were merciless. There was no meekness, 
there was no humility. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, they had only head and hand religion rather than heart righteousness. The society looked for, I told you, a military messiah. That the zealots were looking for a military kind of messiah that will be able to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. They were looking for war, not for peace. And so as Jesus Christ came to tell them, saying that blessed are the peacemakers, who were they to make peace with? Were they to make peace with the Romans? That was what their hearts recoiled from. This message then was diametrically opposed to popular religious notions. The kingdom of God is so different and will always be different from the kingdoms of the world. The three Beatitudes we are looking at today speak of mercy, of purity, and of peace. Let's look at them one by one. Number one, mercy from recipients of grace. Mercy from those who have received grace. And as we are here this morning, I believe that we have received grace of the Lord. We recognize our poverty of spirit when we came. When we came across the Lord, across the word of God, we realized we had nothing in our hands that we could use or we could give unto God to appease God, to have forgiveness for our sins. Having received grace, what are we going to give to other people? Having received forgiveness, what are we going to do to other people? Having received eternal life, the gift of God, what is going to be our reaction, our response to other people? Having received showers of blessing from God, blessings uncountable, innumerable, blessings beyond the things we can count even in this world. There's even a home in heaven waiting for you. Your name in the book of life. And God answering your prayer. He's answered your prayer before. He's answering your prayer now. He'll continue to answer your prayer. With all that God has done, all that God is doing, all that God is still going to do for you, in what way are you going to show that you are being a beggar and God took you away from the dunghill and brought you to the throne? And there are still other beggars who are stretching out their empty hands. Are you going to look away? Are you going to say, well, I am so fortunate, I am so lucky, I received from the Lord. What is going to be your response? Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is very important and indispensable. In the character of those who belong to God and who belong to his kingdom, having been accepted graciously without merit. Let's always remember that. That God has accepted us into the kingdom without merit. We have received divine mercy. Without merit, we have been saved. Now it is our turn to manifest the character and the nature of God and to do for others what he has done for us, to give and to show mercy unto others. In Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 21. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life righteousness and honor actually you see when you show mercy you are doing good to yourself you follow after righteousness and mercy that as a child of god you have a principle you have a goal in life you bind yourself by the covenant of righteousness and mercy you say now that i'm a child of god my response in life my attitude to the whole of life, my response to anything, everything that anybody may do, when I see human need, when I see poverty, when I see difficulty, 
when I see problems in the life of other people, here is a covenant I make with my God. I will follow after righteousness and mercy. In the thoughts that we think, there will be thoughts of mercy. We'll be finding out. We'll be making a research. What can I do to show mercy? Because you see, sometimes you need to really make some research in the spirit of God. To know what the other people need. It may be a good word in season. Good encouragement at the right time. Good counsel at the right time. Or maybe material things that the people need to be able to satisfy their need and help them out of their problem. It may be that you need to provide a solution to their problem. You make it a principle of life. And you count that day lost when you have not shown mercy. You want to retire to bed at night. And you examine your life from the morning till that evening. And you say, did I speak any good word today? Did I alleviate and did I relieve the pain and the suffering of someone today? Did I wipe away anybody's tears today? Did I comfort the sorrowful today? Was there a need in this world, in this community, that God used me to answer and to meet today? Was there a fallen individual God helped me to raise up today? Here is the day that the day is passing. Have I done anything to make life convenient for anyone today? Have I manifested the nature and the character of God today? Have I been merciful today? And if you discover that you've not done any of those things that day, don't you know that day is like it is lost? Because we need to show mercy. And this is the very nature and the character of God. In Proverbs chapter 11 verse 17, Proverbs 11, verse 17. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. The merciful person is doing good unto his own soul. Why? Because give and it shall be given unto you. You speak a good encouraging word to other people, you are going to have it back. You give to the needy, to the poor, to the beggars. You are going to have it back. God is going to make sure that that deed of kindness you sow, that good word you gave, you sow it, you are going to reap an abundance of it. But then it says in chapter 11, that verse 17, He that is cruel, he that is cruel, not considerate of how people feel, not considerate of the needs of people. Not considerate that when people are sorrowful, we need to be able to render a helping hand. He that is cruel troubles his own flesh. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 21. He that despises his neighbor sinneth, but he that has mercy on the poor, happy is he. If because you are well, because you are sound, because you appear to have all your bodily parts active, healthy, sound, normal, functioning. Because of that you see a lame person. You see the blind on the street. Or you see those people that are deformed. Or you see the beggars. Or you see the unfortunate and the downtrodden in life. Or you see the people that have not got as much as you have got. And you despise them. Because they are not like you. They are not complete like you. They do not have all the various parts of the body like you do. It says, he that despises his neighbor is sinning. But then, he that has mercy on the poor. Here is a blind man, and he's asking for help. And then you realize, I could have been blind too. Because many times, the blindness is not the fault of theirs. It may be because of the defect at the time of their birth. It may be because of the blowing of the sand in the place where they lived when they were young. 
It may be because of some kind of disease that affected some tissues and some parts of the eyes. Or it may be because of a kind of sickness that came upon them that that place became so numb that they didn't have any feeling there. And therefore they will scratch and scratch until they cannot have any feeling. Eventually everything goes blind. Or it may be because of the action of Satan and evil spirit on them. And that could have happened to me as it has happened to them. Because to realize, oh God, how grateful I am that I can see. How grateful I am, I am not lame. How grateful I am, I am healthy and I can fend for myself. That moves you to want to show mercy. And after all, you have received mercy from the Lord. In the physical, in the spiritual, and in every way possible. And it says, he that has mercy on the poor. God will make sure that that man will be happy. Will be happy. Because God delights in mercy. In Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verse 25. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. So you see, all these scriptures encourage us that we should show mercy. But then showing mercy is not limited to just giving people things. It's also, it also means withholding something. Let me show you what that means. In James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and in verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy. That has showed no mercy. For mercy rejoiceth against judgment. You see, mercy is also withholding criticism, withholding opposition, withholding anything, everything you know will be inconveniencing to your fellow brother, to your fellow sister. The word mercy, as used in the Hebrew Old Testament text and in the Greek New Testament text, means a lot of things. Number one, it means to succor the afflicted. Two, to give help to the needy. Three, to rescue the miserable. Four, to be of benefit to someone in need. So when you are showing mercy, it means that you see the afflicted. You see the unfortunate or the people that do not have enough. You are able to succor them support them help them you give help to the needy now the needy may happen to be your wife being merciful is giving help to the needy one it may be at the time she's sick and therefore you have to curtail your movement and you even have to rearrange your activities so that you will be able to give help to your needy wife it might be your needy husband, his need in this area or that area. Being merciful will mean that you are giving help. The man may be strong when he's well, may be very active when he's well. But now in his sickness, in his weakness, or in this particular need in his life, he needs help. And you are the closest one as a wife to give that help. And blessed are the merciful. Because they will receive mercy. And the needy may be your little child. And that child needs care. And that child needs attention. Now the needy might be somebody that is very close by a neighbor. And you have discovered a need in that life. The needy might be a fellow brother in the church. Or the needy might be a neighbor that is not a member of the church. You give help to the needy. You rescue the miserable. There are people that have gotten entangled in some of the nets that you find in this world. And because of that, they get into mystery, into suffering. And we will not say, well, that's their fault. They got themselves into those conditions. We rescue them. You be of benefit to someone in need. The merciful gives to the poor. He feeds the hungry. He clothes the naked. He forgives the offender. He meets the needs of the needy. 
These are the things that God expects that we do in our lives, and then we're showing mercy. The merciful person will never hold a grudge. You know why? Because if he holds a grudge, that grudge will become a wall of partition between him and the needy person. Because it may be your enemy that comes into need. It may be a person that has persecuted you, that you find in need. You never bear a grudge so that you'll be free to show mercy unto everyone. You never retaliate. They do evil, but you do good. You are never vengeful and you never slander. Mercy is compassion and sympathy in action. Not sympathy in silence. Not compassion that is quiet. You see, that is not mercy. Because mercy is not how you feel. Mercy is what you do in a tangible way. It is not silent sympathy. It acts in love. It cares for those in need in a tangible manner. Meeting the need, not just feeling the need. And Christ is our grand example of being merciful. He's the most merciful person that ever lived. And you will see that Jesus Christ showed mercy every time. Even at times when you would have thought, how could a person show mercy at such a time? Do you remember that those uh, who wanted to kill him, crucify him, they came. As they were to take him, Peter took out the sword and he cut off one ear. And that is the time you think, how can a person show mercy? He has a lot of problems himself. Judas is going to turn against him. And these people are going to take him. And this was Peter defending him. He bent down, took that ear and performed a miracle. And when he performed that miracle, all he was doing was showing mercy and leaving you and I an example that in a time of our own difficulty, in a time when other people are forsaking us, in a time when there is no friend remaining around, in a time when it appears that even the father is turning his back on the beloved son, yet was still to continue sh to show mercy, Mercy then begin, becomes a principle of your life. That as you breathe, you show mercy. After all, when you are sick, you keep on breathing. And every time you keep on breathing, even if there is pain, if there is affliction, if there is persecution, whatever you are going through, you keep on showing mercy. That is the example we have from the Lord. This mercifulness then is a holy compassion of soul which moves us to pity others and relieve those in their mysteries. It makes us willing to forgo personal comfort, forgo personal interest, forgo personal gratification in order to care for others. It is a spirit of kindness that cares for all. It is opposed to partiality, which is generous to some and harsh to others. The mercy that Jesus spoke about is not the kind of partial sin that you are generous to some people but you are harsh to others. This mercy is an operative principle within the result of Christ living in us. But then as we look at the life of Jesus Christ and as we look at God himself, we know that the mercy we're talking about is not limited to only caring for things that are physical. Let's look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and in verse 31. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. And I see would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. As we examine the way we have shown mercy in the past, if we look at it and we say, yes, I praise the Lord, I show mercy to my wife and to my husband, I show mercy to my children, I show mercy to those who are close by, I show mercy to the brothers and to the sisters and members of the same church, Jesus said, what thank have you? 
even the sinners will do likewise. But in verse 33, And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Now you can see that the principle in the word of God goes beyond the moral life that the unbelievers live. That people will say that fellow is generous, is kind-hearted. We are to go beyond all that. It says now in verse 35, love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. We do not have any right to say, I've been showing mercy. But people are always unthankful. People are not reacting and responding in the good way I've been living. Therefore, I want to change my style of living. I've seen that showing mercy doesn't pay. Well, Jesus Christ healed the people. He cast out devils. And after he did all that he did, all he said was crucify him. And then here he was on the cross. And there was one man, the thief, one of the thieves on the cross. And he said, Lord, remember me. Well, Jesus could have thought, well, look at all the people I healed. All the people I showed mercy to. Look at what they have done. And look at what it has led, where it has led me. And here you say, remember me. Well, I've not made up my mind because of the reaction of the people that I showed mercy to in the past. And this is what they have done to repay me. No more of that. But Jesus said today, you'll be with me in paradise. That is the heart of the Christian. That is the life of the Christian. That we never say, I've done enough. And what I've done, the people have not appreciated. Therefore, I'm not doing good to anybody again. We cannot do that. In verse 35, the latter part, God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. In verse 36, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. You see, when we think about the mercy of God, it's not only in the physical things. We know that he's merciful on us because he has taken away our sin. He has given us sin, includes is forgiving us. And therefore, we know that when God shows mercy, it's not only giving physical things, material things. He shows mercy in blessing us in wonderful spiritual ways. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy, and for his great love, wherewith he saved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. God showing mercy unto us has included our spiritual need. In that he has saved us of his mercy and of his grace. If we are to be as merciful as God, we'll consider the spiritual needs of people too. So then, we're not only caring for the bodies of men and women. We're concerned for the stage of their souls. Mercy pities the lost and draws them into the kingdom of God. Mercy prays for the lost and preaches the gospel to them. It is mercy that makes us to do everything we can do. To go into those villages and go everywhere, opening the eyes of the ignorant, of the sinners, to God's inexhaustible provision of grace, righteousness, and salvation. We must be as merciful as God in a world that is as merciless as Satan. You see, if you look around you, you might see that the generality of people are merciless, especially at a time of this kind of economy, when you don't even have enough to eat. You don't have enough to take care of your family. And because of that, the nature of Satan is what you see all over the country, all over the world. But remember, as the children of the devil are as merciless as Satan is merciless, we who are children of God will be as merciful as God is merciful. 
before we leave this uh, section of, the, of showing mercy, we need to understand that in Scripture, there is a noticeable connection between mercy and some other things. That mercy is never in isolation. Already you can see that because it is compassion in action. But in Daniel chapter 9 verse 9, we see mercy and forgiveness. Mercy and forgiveness. Which means, therefore, that if you, if you are really merciful, you will forgive and forget all the offenses and injuries that people have done against you. Because there is an unbreakable chain or link between mercy and forgiveness. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, there is connection between mercy and love. Mercy and love. If you are really merciful, there will be love. In fact, mercy flows out of love. Now put it this way, mercy is greater than forgiveness. The reason we say that is that now you show mercy by forgiving. But that's not only how you show mercy. Somebody who has not offended you at all, who doesn't need any forgiveness from you, you show mercy unto them. The needy person, the stranger who has never met you, who has never offended you, you show mercy unto such people. So there is forgiveness in mercy. But mercy is bigger than forgiveness. But now compare mercy and love. Love is greater and broader than mercy. Because, you see, love does a lot of things apart from being merciful. Love expresses itself in greater ways and broader ways than mercy. So then, it is like mercy is in the middle. On this side, there is love that is greater than mercy. Always supplying something to that mercy. And then forgiveness is smaller than mercy. But mercy is always giving forgiveness unto the people that offend. Now there's that connection, mercy and forgiveness. There's that connection, mercy and love. There's also mercy and grace. You see, grace will give out something that the people do not merit. And there is a part of grace that is showing mercy. When God gives us something, like he gives us salvation, we don't merit it. It is only of the grace of God. And it is the expression of the mercy of God. In the same way, when you are gracious to people, you don't deal with people on the basis of marriage. Isn't that the reason why our marriages are not working? Because the husband is dealing with his wife on the basis of marriage, not on the basis of grace. Isn't that why we have problems in our marriages? The wife is trying to do something only to the limit of the marriage of the husband. But then grace will not deal with us on the basis of marriage. You will just give what the people do not marriage. And in that way, you have mercy and grace associated together. You have mercy and compassion. Remember the story of that man that was injured between Jericho and Jerusalem. And eventually this Samaritan came and he showed mercy on him in that he had compassion on him. So then if you are merciful, there will be compassion. You feel the compassion within, but the compassion is not going to stay there. The compassion is going to act out in mercy because mercy is compassion in action. There's also mercy and justice. Mercy never contradicts justice. Otherwise, law and order will break down. Mercy will never contradict righteousness. Will never contradict holiness. You will not encourage uncleanness. Because you say, well, the principle of my life is mercy. Because of that, whether there's righteousness or not, I just want to react or do like this. Because you see, actually, mercy and truth are joined together. They're not supposed to be separated. And therefore, you cannot show mercy in any way that will contradict truth, that will propagate error. In Psalm 85, Psalm 85, looking at verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Don't separate them. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So then we realize that the connection 
between mercy and righteousness, mercy and justice, mercy and truth must not be broken. Forgiveness as its source in mercy. Mercy flows out of love. Mercy deals with the pain, the need, the problem, the distress, while grace deals with the sin that caused the problem originally. Mercy acts in compassion. Mercy never violates nor contradicts justice or holiness. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And again, we're looking at that verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God will so arrange things in life that the merciful will always receive mercy. Now we go to the next point. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Remember that the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the Sadducees were the religious leaders of the day. They were the people that actually projected themselves as the people of God, the children of God, and the teachers of the right way to worship God. But then you remember that there are eight blessednesses here. That is, eight blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. If you can't, you may uh, see nine, but you see we we'll put all the ones on persecution all together. And as you see all these eight, then you look at what Jesus proclaimed and pronounced on the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. And again, he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. And uh, it says, because you are hypocrites, he repeats it again, woe unto you, woe unto you, woe unto you. Why? What you discover in Matthew chapter 23 is external religion. Hand religion. Head religion. Whereas what you discover in Matthew chapter 5 is heart religion. It's dealing with the heart, the poverty of spirit. It's dealing with the heart, mourning because of sin, godly sorrow for sin. The meekness, the hunger, the thirst after righteousness, the mercy that is flowing out of compassion from within, the purity of heart, the peace, you become the ambassador of peace because you are the prince of peace living within you. And a consequence of the fact that even though you are righteous, they are persecuting you. And there's this joy that is flowing from within you. So well, so then in Matthew chapter 5, it's inward religion internal religion it is a purity of heart most people are satisfied with head religion they suppose that all is well if they have some head knowledge of sound doctrine others content themselves with hand religion being satisfied if they are busily engaged in what they term christian service however god is looking for heart righteousness this is a passage you know, but let's look at it. In 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. But the Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord looketh on the heart. The Bible has a lot to say about the heart of man. In fact, the heart of the matter is the spiritual state of the heart. The heart is the center of our life and of our being. As we look at the heart of the natural man, the Bible says the heart of the natural man is deceptive, deceitful. It says it is wicked. The Bible proclaims that the heart of the natural man is evil. It's covetous. It's subtle. devilishly clever. Mischievous. It's perverse. It's uncircumcised. It's impenitent. It is darkened. It is hard. It is stony. We, have, we don't have time to read all the references. 
that refer to the heart in that way. But let us understand this. When Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart. There may be people that are wondering, how do I know whether my heart is pure or not? Well, if the heart is pure, it will not be a deceitful heart. There will be no intention. There will be no desire. There will be no inclination to be deceitful in anything you say, in anything you do, in anything you think. There will be no wickedness in that heart. It will have been purged of real wickedness, outright wickedness, moderate wickedness, subtle wickedness, clever wickedness that a person can do and injure another fellow without anybody knowing, methodical wickedness. You see, all that will not be in the heart when the heart is pure. There will be no evil, evil in the heart. When the heart is purified, there will be no covetousness in the heart. There will be no subtlety in the heart. You see, subtlety is the trait of the snake, the trait of the serpent, and it is the trait of the devil. You see, where the heart is always planning to get advantage over that person's ignorance, where the heart is always planning to do this and get away with it because there is a cleverness that the heart can devise in a mischievous way then there is no purity of heart there will be no mischief there will be no perverseness perverseness is the ability to twist something in various ways there are people that are perverted in uh, their dealings with the opposite sex there are people that are perverted in making use of the things of this world. They are perverted in their use of language, in their use of women, in, their, in everything that they do. But you see, the heart will not be perverted. You see, the literature, the pornography, a lot of materials that people read is the perversion of the things, of the good things that God has given us. And a heart will not be uncircumcised controlled internally by the old selfish man it will not be impenitent a heart that has never been sorry a heart that has never regretted all the evil that he did a heart that has never repented it will not be a darkened heart you see when we say the heart is pure it means that the darkness of ignorance the darkness of a uh, scriptural tradition the darkness of idol worship the darkness of demonic activities all that is gone it will not be a hard heart a hard heart you see when your heart is pure that heart will also be soft if the heart is hard, then it is not pure. You see, you know, when they, you know that the heart is hard when we are callous. When you can step on another person's toes and the fellow is crying and the fellow is saying, it pains me. And then you just act as if you don't recognize you are causing pain to anybody. Maybe, once again, the closest person to you. That if you say you are a Christian, and the closest person to you, and that might be your husband, that might be your wife, is crying secretly because of things to do. And you so put that woman under that she cannot even speak out that my husband, I'm not enjoying this relationship. Things are difficult for me. See the way we live. I can't express myself. I'm not free. I'm not happy, and I want to be a good wife, but the conditions are not conducive for us to even talk together, for us to even relate together properly. And after the woman has said that, the man just says, that's your interpretation, and while the woman is weeping, just rises up and walks away. Now, if the heart is hard like that, as grace touched us, as the blood of Jesus cleansed us, why can't God do something within us that a stony heart that has no feeling, no consideration for other people, especially the mother of your children, especially the one that is serving you, cooking for you, washing your clothes, and you don't pay for that, and doing a lot of things, and more than likely, the wife 
labors and works more than the man. Well, especially those of us here who are preaching. Here we are, we are busy only reading the Bible and studying the Bible. And when we finish studying the Bible, the food is ready. And when we want to go out, the clothes are already ironed. And there's somebody doing that. And there's never a thank you. There's never an appreciation. It's only complaint. Eh? You don't know Bible. Oh, my brother, if she doesn't cook and took all the time she spent in the kitchen studying the Bible like you, she will know Bible more than you do. If she doesn't have to wash all those plates and all those clothes, if she doesn't have to scrub all that floor and do everything that she is doing, if she takes all the time that you take studying the Bible, she might know the Bible more than you. Have we any mouth to complain that our wives don't know the Bible? When we never get to the kitchen with them, we never help them in any way, and they carry pregnancy for those nine months, and, uh, you know, some of those uh, lucky families that, you know, immediate, when one year runs out like this, new year, new child comes. A woman that is carrying the eighth child, and as the, the one, the number seven, is still even wanting to breastfeed, and number eight has come. How would this woman be able to study Bible? Do we have the right to complain that eh, you don't know Bible, you don't know this one, you are not spiritual? Maybe if we didn't increase the number of children on her, she's carrying one in hand, she's carrying the other one at the back, she's petting the other one on the bed to sleep, maybe if she doesn't have to do all that, she will know Bible. Don't complain again. Let's be soft. Let the hardness of heart let it be taken away from us. Because if the heart is hard, then that heart is of the natural. It is not pure. And of course, the heart must not be stony. When grace, the grace of God, acts upon the heart, it will soften the heart. It has softening power. And what we find the grace of God doing upon the heart, according to the revelation of the Bible, number one, it makes us to have a broken and a contrite heart. Number two, it makes the heart tender. Number three, it makes the heart clean. Number four, it makes the heart honest and good. That's in the parable of the sow of the seed. The seed falls into the good ground. And Jesus said, that is the honest and the good heart. It makes the heart true. That's in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Where we approach God with a true heart. It makes the heart new. Ezekiel chapter 36. Telling us, I will give you a new heart. I will take the stony heart out of your flesh. It makes the heart to be circumcised. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart. And the heart of thy seed. To love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind. It makes the heart upright makes the heart pure and makes the heart perfect towards god in first kings chapter 8 first kings chapter 8 and in verse 61 in first kings 8 61 this is what we read let your heart therefore be perfect with the lord our god to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. So then, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is not enough to be pure in words, to be pure in outward deportment, purity of heart, purity of desires, purity of motives, purity of intents should characterize us as children of God. A pure heart is one in which the nature and the love of God has been so implanted that it loves what God loves and hates what God hates. That is real purity of heart. And let us see that God demands this in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24. Verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. 
He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. In Second Chronicles, look at this, Second Chronicles chapter 25. And in verse 2, God looks at everything we do. He looks beyond the outward activities. And we may do something correct outwardly. If that thing is not done with a perfect heart, even though it appears correct outwardly, the Lord is still not happy and fully satisfied. In Second Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. You see what God is looking for? There are times that the outward comportment, the outward attitude, the outward expression, and the external things may appear correct, appear to be in place. We speak it the right way. We say it in the proper manner. And we do it in the right way. And we work out that thing, and it appears good on the surface, externally. But God is looking at the heart, whether it is pure, perfect, or not. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. If a heart is not pure, not perfect, not sought, not circumcised, the Lord is calling upon us. To come to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb. So that we can be totally cleansed and our heart will be completely pure. In James chapter 4 verse 8. James chapter 4 verse 8. Draw nigh to God and I will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. It means that if we're double-minded, it means we're not pure in the sight of God. If we're not decided, halting between two opinions, we're not steady in the worship of God. It means that something needs to be done so that our heart will be completely pure. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. It's available for everyone. If we talk to the Lord in prayer, he will definitely purify our hearts as we believe in him. And it is the pure in heart that will have, that have had their hearts purified, even as he is pure. They are purified from every unholy affection. They have been cleansed from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the sight of God. What's the promise for them? They shall see God. He will manifest himself unto them. He will cause his presence to go before them continually. And the light of his countenance will shine upon them. They shall see him as it were face to face. And talk with him as a man talketh with his friend. Purity of heart cleanses the eye of the soul and makes God visible. But then there is a future fulfillment of that promise. They shall see God, meaning that when they shall awake on the final day, they will see the Lord. In Psalm 17, Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. That time we shall see him as he is. Because we have purified ourselves in the blood of the Lamb, even as he is pure. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Looking at it now from verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Here Jesus Christ spoke of something very important. And he spoke as a prince of peace. And he is Christ our peace. 
is the one that has reconciled us with God. And being justified by faith, we are peace with God. But then he wants us to live in peace with other people. You will see the order here. First of all, be pure in heart. And then you have this peacemaking. It is this order that you discover in James chapter 3. Verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Then peaceable. First pure. Then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. There must first be a peaceable spirit before there will be active efforts put forth to make peace. You see, before you can be a peacemaker, you have a peaceable spirit within you. You have made peace with God. And the prince of peace will be allowed to reign in your heart, in your life. It's only then you can be a peacemaker in a warring and divided world. I've been in touch into the peace provided by the blood of Christ. We then endeavor to live in peace with all men. The world is living in malice and envy. Hateful and hating one another. Followers of the Prince of Peace will live peaceably with all men, all men, all men, abstaining from deliberate injury of others. You will not want to deliberately injure another person in your speech, in your interaction, in your action, anything that you do. Such people will delight in reconciling those who are estranged and making wrongs right, promoting unity and preventing discord and healing breaches. When we say that a person is a peacemaker, it means that you delight in reconciling those who are at enmity against one another. And of course, to do that from the foundation and the platform, that you yourself, you are at peace with everybody, at peace with God at peace with your friends, at peace with your neighbors, at peace with the believers, even at peace with your persecutors. They won't like to be at peace with you, but as much as it lies in you, as much as it is possible, you try to live in peace with all men. You make wrongs right. You see, that can create peace. When you make, you know that you have offended somebody, and that is bringing some disharmony or discord, or disunity, or the lack of peace between you. And because of that offense, the peace between you has been disturbed. Then you go to him, and you make the rights wrong. You apologize. And he may want to bring up uh, the fact that, well, what actually pained me is that before he learns to say, I realize it, I'm sorry about it. And you have a gentle tone, a soft voice, and as you make those wrong things right, you are promoting peace. And as a person that is a peacemaker, you promote unity. If you happen to be working uh, with a group of people, if there's any problem there, you will not spark up the problem or make the problem to increase. You are going to promote peace. You prevent discord. And you heal breaches if people are turning their backs on one another. You allow God to use you as an instrument to bring them together. Christians who are ambassadors of peace do not get involved in revolts, in riots, in strikes, in protest matches. Here we are from various countries in West Africa and some Central African countries. And you find that the real thing, the issues in, in the various countries we have come from, is that sometimes they will say that we should have protest matches. It may be in Togo, 
or it may be in Gabon. It may be where some of the Nigerians, for example, in Gabon, some of the Nigerians have been sent back to Nigeria. And some of the Nigerians might be so offended that they want to say, well, we're going to have protest matches. Christians will not get involved. We are peacemakers. We are not people that will raise up riots. We will not revolt. What if we're persecuted? Oh, we bear it and we rejoice and we pray. And we appeal to God. Our strength is in prayer. Our strength is not in revolt. Our strength is not in rioting. It may be that, like for example in Togo, that because of, you know, the people want a change of government and they want this sometimes, the other people, the opposition, they want the people to do this. And there may be some Christians that will be saying, yes, this sin is justified. That should be done because we don't like this kind of government. Well, if we don't like the kind of government, we talk to God about it. We pray about it. We don't do anything by violence, by rioting. All we can do is pray. How do we pray? That God will give us a peaceful government. So we'll be able to serve God. We don't join the unbelievers and begin to riot. Or it may be that in our schools. Our students may find out that the principal of the school and the teacher of the school, maybe they feel that they are not giving them all that they ought to give them. It may be at the university, it may be at the college of education, that some of these students will get the student union people together and then get all those people together and say, now we're not going to go to classes. Now what does a Christian do? Well, if they say don't go to classes, you as a Christian, you cannot go to the class because if you do, those people can come to the class and beat you up. You are not going to riot with them. You are not going to tear down anything with them. You are not going to break a, a classes. You are not going to break the glasses in the classrooms with them. You are not going to destroy any school property. You stay in your hostel. And if they call the police, if the government calls the police and says, now all students go home, you, are, you shouldn't be some, one of those students that will face the police and the tear gas and say, well, if you police are used tear gas, we're going to use broken bottle. It, those are the children of the devil that want to fight it out like that. If they say, pack your load, now go to go back home now, and eventually when you hear announcement over the radio, we call you back when things are peaceful. You as a child of God, you are the first person to get back home. And when you get back home, you still bring your books home, and you are reading your books, and you are preparing for your exam. But not that we Christians will be the president of the student union, will be the people that are instigating and are saying, this one is not right, this one is not right, this one must go, that one must go. We Christians are not involved in that at all. Don't you know the spirit that is in you? Don't you know that you are for the kingdom of God? Even though you are a student, you are a preacher, you are an ambassador of peace. Christ sent you to that school, not to go and fight, but to go and preach the gospel by your life to show that you represent the prince of peace so then anywhere we may be whether at school or in any other place we are for peace if that is what should happen in the country and in the school how about in the church do you know that sometimes there may be problem in the church well, problem has always been because there are backsliders and because there are people that are not careful enough to look at the word of God. It may be that some people begin to go about and say, we're going to displace that pastor. We're going to do this. We're going to write. Don't join the people. The people that are for tearing down. The people that are for, you know, going against the pastor. The Bible calls your pastor. It may be the pastor of just a local church. And the local church may just be 15 in membership. The Bible says that that pastor of 15 people is the anointed of the Lord. He may not even be a region overseer yet. He may not even be a district pastor yet. Just a village church of 15 people. The Bible says he's the anointed of the Lord. And I will not touch the anointed of the Lord. But there are some people that I don't know what, how they can do that. Their pastor is preaching like this. They will come and take the microphone. They say, no, we don't want to do that. It happens in some churches. We who are children of God, we want to go to heaven, or why did you come to the kingdom of God? 
Don't you want to go to heaven? What are we fighting about? It's because that man is doing this. You know, in the Bible, Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve. And he was doing some things that were not right. And Jesus had not removed him. He left him there. And John, John didn't remove him. Peter didn't remove him. All the other people, Matthew, Matthew knew about accounts. If you talk about accounts, and if you talk about all this, uh, you know, tax collection, Matthew knew it more than Judas Iscariot. It was his profession. Matthew did not remove him. If Jesus has left that person there, the will of the Lord be done. That's Christianity. A Christian will not fight. A Christian will not try out. A Christian is not going to go against government. A Christian is not going to go against church. A Christian is not going to destroy family. A Christian is not going to go about gossiping. A Christian is not going to say, I see, I see. Whatever you see, if you don't see Christ, you have not seen enough. If all you see is sin, I see so and so's fault. I see so and so's shortcoming. I see so and so's this and that. Why don't you look at Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith? When we're children of God, we're the ambassadors of peace. There will be peace in your heart. There will be peace in your family. There will be peace in your church. And there will be peace in your community. Because you are not going to support rioting or revolt or breaking things or destroying things. Therefore, let us make sure that as we're learning all this, blessed are the peacemakers. For they and they only shall see God. Therefore, we will pray that God will help us, that peace will reign in our hearts and in our midst in Jesus' name. Before we pray, peace is never, now listen to this, it's important, peace is never to be sought at the expense of righteousness. That means somebody says, the only way we can have peace together in this place is give up holiness or oh, we say no follow peace with all men and holiness what god has joined together let no man put asunder it is peace and holiness not peace without holiness therefore once somebody doesn't touch our holiness doesn't say we shouldn't worship god doesn't say we can't read our bible doesn't say that we cannot pray doesn't say we cannot hold on to some doctrine once he allows us to keep our righteousness and to keep our holiness, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The kind of peace that sacrifices truth and holiness is no more the kind of peace that God desires or God promotes. In scripture, there's always a close connection between peace and truth. Peace and truth. So then, we cannot have peace at the expense of truth. That means we cannot say give up sound doctrine. Give up truth. So that we can have peace together. That's what all these other gospel churches are telling us. They are telling us that you see now we are apart. We are not living peacefully together. And the cause is because of the truth that deeper life emphasizes. Sanctification. Or any other truth of the doctrine of the word of God. They say, if we can be quiet on that truth of sanctification, we will have peace together. We cannot do that. Because once again, peace and truth are joined together. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 19, just write it now. There's no time to read all the references now. Therefore, we have the truth. Once you don't take the truth away from us, we're going to be at peace with you. But if you touch that truth, we say, no, I will have the truth. I'll keep to that truth. You may fight, I will not fight, but I will keep the truth. You may knock me, but I'm not going to knock you. I will keep the truth. It is peace and truth. And when you are willing to take that truth, as I am willing to take that truth, then we come to join together in peaceful existence. Peace and righteousness. Peace and, right and holiness. I've told you that already. Peace and equity. Peace and justice. We cannot allow injustice. We cannot say, okay, uh, let us destroy so-and-so. 
And the only way we can have peace together is to agree together in injustice. No, we cannot do that because peace and justice are together. Peace and equity are together. That's Malachi chapter 2 verse 6. Peace and love. Peace and love. We love one another and we stay together in peace. Peace and faithfulness. Second Samuel chapter 20 verse 19. Peace and faithfulness. And then peace and grace. Peace and mercy. Peace and gentleness. Peace and goodwill. We're not merely to effect peace between men and men, but we're to reconcile men unto God. We are ambassadors of peace. And we're to beat sinners, throw down their weapons of warfare and be reconciled unto God. Before we pray, what should we do so that we always have peace with one another and maintain peace with one another? We who follow the Prince of Peace, ambassadors of peace, this is very important to us. And as we pray, we need to make up our minds and have something like a covenant with God and with ourselves that this is the way we will live. What do we do then to have this peace with one another and to maintain the peace? Number one, we think the thoughts of peace. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. We think the thoughts of peace. That's the way God thinks. I know the thought I think towards you. Thoughts of peace. You see, trouble starts in our thoughts. Trouble starts in our imagination. Trouble starts in what we're thinking about. What I'm thinking towards my beloved brother. What I'm thinking towards my beloved sister. It is something imagined. I have not checked up. It is not real. It is the devil bringing it up to cause problem between me and my brother. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb together. He said something, and I didn't know what he meant. I didn't know what he really wanted to say. Then in the thought of my mind, there is an, a misinterpretation. It is not thought that causes us not to have peace together. So then point number one, as we want to have peace with one another and retain that peace and maintain that peace, the thought of peace. Number two, speaking the words of peace. Don't you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If I think the thoughts of peace, and then what I'm going to say will be words of peace, words of peace that's in deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 26 you make up your mind that towards all our brothers and our sisters who are here if any thought comes in your mind that you know is not the thought of peace that's of the devil you will not allow it therefore you have the thought of peace as a foundation then you go ahead and speak the words of peace think before you speak meditate before you speak Weigh those words before you speak. Test those words before you say them out. If I say this word, will it preserve our peace? Will it bring misunderstanding? Will it bring discord among us? Words of peace. Number three, you give answers of peace. That is Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 11. The answers of peace. Here we are, we are conversing together. Before we started the conversation, both of us, because we are Christians, we, we, we thought the thoughts of peace. And we have already made up our minds, we are going to speak the words of peace. And then brother A is the first to speak. And what he speaks, and what the result is going to be, is going to depend upon my answer. And therefore the answer I give must be the answer of peace in our home between husband and wife between parents and children between those who are living together as brothers maybe you are not married yet and you are living together and sisters you are not married yet who are living together answers of peace all the time number four the council of peace that's in zechariah chapter 6 and verse 13 now, somebody has come to you 
is your friend. And he has complained. And actually what he has done is that he has not gone through all these points we have mentioned. He didn't think in peace. He wasn't speaking the words of peace. He has misunderstood his brother or his sister. And he comes to you and he's your, he's your friend. He wants to get something out of you to counsel him. What are you going to give? According to Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13, counsel of peace. Never counsel anybody to riot, to rebel, to revolt, to fight back, to retaliate, to seek to be even with the other person and to demand his right to break up everything if necessary, to be able to have his way. Never, never counsel like that. You may feel that this fellow is injured, you may feel that he has been cheated. You may feel that he has been oppressed. Counsel him to be like Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Tell him, blessed are the poor in spirit. Tell him, blessed are they that mourn. Tell him, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Tell him, blessed are the merciful. Tell him, blessed are the pure in heart. Tell him, Blessed are the peacemakers. So then shall we be called the children of God. Let's rise up and let us pray. Are we merciful? Are we merciful? And are we pure? And do we maintain peace? In society, peace in our place of work, peace in our country, as much as it lies in you, you are not going to contribute to the tearing down of your country, to rioting and revolt in your country or in your school. In your community in the village where you live you are not going to contribute to anything that will bring destruction and disunity and in the church of the living God you are not going to do anything or say anything that will disturb the peace of the people of God you are not going to teach a wife against her husband. You are not going to teach and counsel her husband against his wife. You are for peace. You are an ambassador of peace. And blessed are the peacemakers.